The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot teaches that there are two forms of arguments. They are arguments that are for the sake of heaven. These are a positive phenomena, and the Mishnah teaches that these will endure. However, there are also arguments that are fueled by ulterior motives. The challenge we'll, we'll discuss today is how to distinguish between them. And this is no easy task. The former Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Har Etzion, Halav Amital Zichrono Lebracha, once reinterpreted the Mishnah as saying that when a debate is for the sake of heaven, it means that the two sides in the argument each say, it's not about money, it's not about my personal honor, it's purely for principle, for the sake of heaven. In these situations, the argument will always endure, as the Mishnah says, because each side will sanctify their position and there'll be no room for compromise. However, it would be wrong to run from arguments and disputes because we know that the argument is so essential for the Jewish condition and so much of, of, the, of the source of the blessings in our lives. The Talmud tells the tale of Rabbi Yochanan that after his study partner, Rish Lakish, passed away, he was totally broken and the rabbis tried to find a replacement for Rish Lakish. But all the candidates he rejected because, as he said, all of them, when I bring my argument, they bring many proofs that I'm right. But I'm looking for someone like Rish Lakish, who, when I would bring my argument, he would, he would bring many proofs that I'm wrong. And will will try to uncover the un uncover how can we truly tell when an argument is for the sake of heaven and when is it for ulterior motives by analyzing the two examples brought in the Mishnah. The, exa the first example is brought from our Parsha. Korach as an example of an argument not for the sake of heaven and later we'll look at the debates between Shammai and Hillel, which are brought as examples, an example of an argument for the sake of heaven. Korach challenges Moshe and Aaron's authority. Korach, his argument is, all of the people of Israel, we are all holy, and therefore we should all be equal. This sounds like a reasonable position, and Moshe's response of falling on his face would seem to be a very uh, not direct response to this valid argument. Um, the problem, however, the problem with Korach apparently wasn't the argument itself, but the motivation behind, behind, uh, behind the argument. However, how can we tell that Mo Korach was driven by anything less than altruism and concern for his fellow Jews, that they should all, all partake in equality. And the Me'a Shiloh answers that, that if we look back, we know that Korach himself was privileged for a special status. Korach is a Levi, and previously the Leviim were separated from the Jewish people and given a special status. We find no record of Korach complaining about achieving a higher status than others. Had Korach authentically be, been concerned about equality, we should have heard his voice of dissent much earlier. The fact that it's only now that he comes out and challenges the status, the leadership of Aaron and Moshe shows that what's bothering him is not that there are people who are less equal than him, but there are people that have a greater status than him. Uh, so his argument is reminiscent of the 
sign in George Orwell's book, Animal Farm, where after the pigs rebel against their human masters, they put up a sign saying, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Korach is looking for an equality in which some of them will be more equal than others. And sometimes the ulterior motives are much more subtle. They're a situation that I think all of us could recognize in which we get into an argument with somebody, it could be a friend, a family member, and it's about an issue that has no personal connection to either of the sides. It could be about politics, it could be about sports, it could be about the weather. But somehow, we each find ourselves getting tense, sweating. The tones of our voices are raised. And, and, we, and when we reflect upon ourselves, or sometimes a third person enters the room, we're in fact embarrassed how we're so emotionally involved with this debate that would seem to be not connected at all to, to myself. The explanation I once heard um, in a lecture by Eckhart Tolle is that in fact it's very illuminating to ex about what is happening and why is it that we get so uptight in these trivial debates. Tolle argues that many of us identify ourselves with our opinions. I am the sum total of all of my opinions. And therefore, when someone argues and debate, disputes my opinions, subconsciously, I experience that as a rejection of myself. Subconsciously, I feel, uh, I feel that if my opinion falls, my, my very essence falls and doesn't have validity. Mm -hmm. That's why when we get into debates, we feel an existential threat from those who debate us, and, and even there, we're not truly for looking for the sake of, uh, of heaven, but rather driven by the subtle ulterior motives. And I think this insight can be so helpful, because when we're aware of this, we, we could get a, a, achieve a consciousness that we know that our opinions are important, but I am not my opinions. And this could allow me to be more objective, more detached in searching for the truth. And let's go on to the next step is, so what is an argument for the sake of heaven? The Rambam explains that, um, that, that this, in Hebrew, this is drishat ha'emet, the search for truth. We have two ingredients here. The first ingredient, the search. When I enter an argument, I am still searching. I have not crystallized my opinion. I have an opinion, but I'm still searching. I'm still open to hear another vantage point. And what am I searching for? I'm searching for the truth. And I'd like to share with you the meaning of the concept of truth in Jewish sources. A Jewish court of law must have three judges. And this is explained by the, the Jerusalem Talmud as connected to the word truth itself. The word truth, emet in Hebrew, has three letters. And these three letters, the Aleph, the Mem, and the Taf, are respectively the first letter of the Jewish alphabet, the middle letter of the Jewish alphabet, and ultimately the last letter in the Jewish alphabet. And this is, comes to teach us that truth, emet, is that which is all-encompassing. Emet is not one vantage point on life and reality, but rather emet is that which could incorporate all the authentic aspects of all the vantage points. 
I have a, my father-in-law reads each, each week both a very left-wing paper and a very right-wing paper in Israel and says that by reading both of them, somehow he could figure out what's happening in our country. He also pointed out that a post, as opposed to the word emet, which encompasses the entire alphabet, the Hebrew word for, for falsehood, sheker, is composed of three consecutive letters at the very end of the alphabet, the shin, the kuf, and the resh, showing that sheker, falsehood, is one singular vantage point on things, and assuming that that's all that there is. Now, the example of an argument for the sake of heaven, as I mentioned earlier, are the arguments the, between Hillel and Shammai. And the, and the Talmud tells of, of a voice that came out of heaven saying that, the, that both the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai, both of their approaches are Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. They are both the words of the living God. Both approaches are authentic. There's truth in both approaches. However, the voice from heaven concluded that the law, the halacha, is according to Beit Hillel. And this is explained as, as, re, as relating to the fact that Hillel had tremendous respect for the words of Shammai. Hillel would teach the words of Shammai and even would always precede Shammai's opinion and present it and only afterward present their opinion, their, their viewpoint on what the halacha is. And I think in light of what, we, we, what we've said till now, we could understand this. As a friend of mine once pointed out, that if the halacha was, was according to Beit Hillel, we never would know what Beit Hillel had to say about these issues. However, Beit Hillel respects and teaches the teachings of Shammai together with his teachings, he is able to achieve a deeper truth, and that's why the halacha is according to Beit Hillel. Shabbat Shalom.